herzlich willkommen zu einer neuen Episode der Evolution Radio Show. Dass Ernährung und unsere psychische Gesundheit doch eng zusammenhängen, das wird immer, immer bekannter. Trotzdem ist es noch weit davon entfernt, dass es Mainstream wird. Umso mehr freue ich mich, dass ich heute die Psychiaterin Dr. Georgia Eid im Podcast als Gast begrüßen darf. Frau Dr. Eid hat am Harvard Cambridge Hospital ihre Ausbildung zur allgemeinen Erwachsenenpsychiaterin gemacht. Dort hat sie dann auch bis 2013 als Psychopharmakologin gearbeitet. 2013 hat sie dann Harvard verlassen und ans Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts gewechselt. Frau Dr. Eid war damals schon die erste und einzige Psychiaterin, die ihren Studenten und den Mitarbeitern an der Universität Ernährungsberatung als Alternative zum Medikamenten, zur Medikamentengabe angeboten hat. Zu ihren Fachgebieten gehört die ketogene Ernährung, Paleoernährung sowie Lebensmittelunverträglichkeiten und sie betreut Studenten und die Mitarbeiter des College hinsichtlich ihrer psychischen Gesundheit. Sie beschäftigt sich intensiv mit den Auswirkungen von Lebensmitteln auf die Gehirnchemie, den Hormonhaushalt und den Stoffwechsel. Sie schreibt für Psychology Today und für ihre Website www.diagnosisdiet.com. Wir sprechen heute über den Einfluss der Ernährung auf die Psyche und die mentale Gesundheit. Wieso hat, macht es Sinn, sich überhaupt mit Ernährung zu beschäftigen, wenn man eine psychische Erkrankung wie Depressionen, bipolare Störungen, ADHS, Psychose oder Angstzustände hat? Außerdem sprechen wir darüber, welche Rolle Antinährstoffe aus Pflanzen dabei spielen und wieso Lebensmittel tierischer Herkunft gerade für unsere Gehirngesundheit so wichtig sind. Viel Freude mit der Folge und ich freue mich auf Kommentare und Anmerkungen. Alles, was du über Keto, Loka und Paleo wissen musst. Evolution Radio Show, dein Programm für evolutionäre Gesundheit, präsentiert von Julia Tulipan. Georgia, very welcome to the Evolution Radio Show. Thank you very much for inviting me, Julia. Um, thank you for coming and for yeah, taking the time to share your knowledge. And so we just met a few weeks ago in Switzerland at the Keto Life Conference. A very interesting and wonderful and great event. And um, but and you are you you're a psychiatrist and you are interested in nutrition and you're working with nutrition and with your so helping your patients with nutrition. Um, but before we get into the nutritional aspects, I would really like to tell you that, that you are telling my my listeners a little bit about just a little bit about you about your background and especially what got you interested in nutrition since psychiatry and nutrition it's not that the, the logical um, connection so when i was in uh in medical school uh in here in the united states Uh, four years of medical school, the way it works here is four years of medical school, and we had maybe two or three hours of nutrition education in four years of medical school, and then four years of psychiatry residency training, we didn't talk about nutrition at all, not once. So when I finished my training, I didn't think about nutrition and psychiatry, I didn't think about the connection at all. Uh, and then I practiced for a number of years, uh, different settings, um, mostly university settings, Harvard University, where I trained, and Smith College, and private practice, and general clinics, hospitals, many different places, but never used nutrition until I had my own health problems in my early 40s. And uh, I went to all of my very smart Harvard doctors, and they could not help me. So I had you know, uh, fatigue and uh, 
um, uh, digestion problems and migraine headaches and sleep problems and all kinds of things, chronic pain. And I, I had, I was exercising every day and I was eating the way I was told to eat, a low fat, uh, low cholesterol, high fiber diet, and I, and lots of fruits and vegetables, and I still uh, was not feeling well. So the doctor said nothing is wrong. All of the different doctors, I had many, many tests. And, and so I, I just decided that I would try to experiment with my diet to see if I could help the digestion problems. And so I experimented with the diet over about six months. I just kept right, I wrote everything down that I ate and all the, the symptoms that I was having. And I just experimented and after about six months all of everything all of the problems were gone i felt fantastic and the diet that i ended up with was mostly meat and very low plants um and you know na no dairy products no soy products it was fair no grains uh no beans all of these things i used to eat and I felt wonderful. And but the interesting thing as a psychiatrist was I felt better emotionally and into, I felt clearer. My I could think better. I was not anxious. I didn't I used to get depressed in the wintertime. I that did not happen anymore. My sleep was good, my energy was good, my concentration. So I became very um, curious about why this diet would be good for the brain. And if I could use this diet to help my patients, which ever since that was 2007 or 2008, so more than 10 years ago, I've been using nutrition, studying nutrition and writing about nutrition and using nutrition with my patients uh, uh, ever, uh, ever since then. Wow, that's, that's super interesting because, um, and ex especially if you think about it, the, the dogma is, the brain needs glucose, you know, and then you're changing your diet to a more or less uh, carnivorous kind of diet, very low in plants, very low in carbohydrates, and your your function better, and and you see all those improvements. You know, and now I eat a, a almost almost no plants now at all, but a, a ketogenic diet, extremely low carbohydrate, almost no carbohydrates, most days zero. And it's even better. So I, uh, I use the ketogenic diet with my patients uh, very, very often. Yeah, we will uh, dig into that a little bit later. But uh, at the at the conference, you talked about the connection between food and the brain. Kind of, yeah, defined your work as as nutritional psychiatry. Yes. Uh, people might probably never heard about that term ever that there is that are you kind of um you know the first one in working or, or defining that field that there is something like nutritional psychiatry do you feel like you're kind of a, a front you know you're the, the that's the frontier i think i'm part part of a very small very very small group there's maybe about half a dozen maybe five or six that I am aware of in the world who are using metabolic psychiatry, looking at brain metabolism, particularly low carbohydrate diets. There are very, very few of us, maybe even less than six. I would have to count in my head. But uh, I, yes, um, this is a brand new field and we need many more psychiatrists to become interested, which is why I like to go and speak at conferences try to get the information out because it's so helpful with patients much more helpful than most medications often mm. from what we or you now know what's your your hypothesis or your your thinking why would a ketogenic or very low carb or low plant based diet work in mental health or in in psychiatric conditions what what's your your hypothesis yeah so my hypothesis is particularly about the low carbohydrate diets uh, most people don't need to remove most of the plants that's if you have a lot of food sensitivities that can be helpful to remove a lot of the plants but for most people simply removing most of the carbohydrate 
will be extremely helpful. And the reason for that, there are three, many, many reasons, but there are three big ones. And one is that when you, when you stabilize your blood sugar levels, your blood glucose, that takes your brain off the roller coaster. And so the blood sugar and insulin levels that are going up and down all day, if you eat a regular diet, you'll get big spikes of glucose and then crashes um, in glucose all day long. And insulin too. And insulin is a hormone. It's a master hormone that controls many, many other hormones in the body, including the stress hormones, for example. And so um, many people, when they're eating this way, will have uh, their mood will change throughout the day, their appetite will change throughout the day, their energy level, their concentration. Um, and it, it's, it's very uh, disruptive. And sometimes people will think, oh, I must have bipolar disorder. I must have a mood disorder. Uh, when or, or their sleep will be, if you eat this way, you may have a big spike and a big crash. Even in the middle of the night, this can happen. It can wake people up and they feel panic, anxiety. So just stabilizing the blood sugar is half of the, of the benefit. Um, and then the, the, other, the other two reasons are um, the, the, when you have a lot of, when you have too much blood sugar or too much insulin, you have inflammation and oxidation in the brain. And these are just, um, it's the biochemistry of the brain that will um, cause a lot of internal damage, uh, t t microscopic damage. That, um, that is at the root of most psychiatric problems is inflammation and oxidation. And a lot of that comes from processed food, sugars and vegetable oils like soybean oil. And then the third reason is this insulin resistance, which I'm sure you talk a lot about, um, is that the more sugar you eat and the more insulin you have in your blood, the brain can become resistant to insulin. And that means that the insulin can't cross the brain. So the sugar goes in, no problem, but the insulin can't get in as easily. So the brain cannot use the glucose without the insulin. So you have high blood, high brain glucose, but low brain insulin. And this is a huge problem because then the brain is starving for energy. It cannot turn the glucose into energy. And this can over time lead to very serious problems like Alzheimer's disease, dementia, even Parkinson's disease risk increases. Um, and, and most of our psychiatric diseases we are slowly learning are related to this problem with the brain processing glucose. Just to, to sum it up, so there is the energy component on, on one side um, and the, so the stable the stabilizing of the blood sugar, sugar and stabilizing of, of insulin levels and not having those spikes and those yeah the, the, the blood sugar roller coaster that's about that's one part and the other part is regulating inflammation and the part with the and insulin resistance exactly and you you just you you mentioned it briefly that the insulin resistance in the brain is a little bit different than insulin resistance in the in the rest of the body. Can you just um, explain it a little bit deeper? What's the what's the problem with or where are the differences? Yes. Uh, so in the body, a lot of people are familiar with type two diabetes. With type two diabetes, um, so what happens in the body with insulin resistance is that the normally if you eat food especially food that contains carbohydrates, you will get, your body will release insulin into the bloodstream and that insulin helps the glucose, the ex, you, when you eat, you'll get a glucose spike from the carbohydrates. The insulin is released to tell the body what to do with that glucose. And in the body, it, for example, will tell the fat cells or the muscle cells um, to unlock and let the glucose in so that you can burn it for energy or you can store it as fat or you can use it to build new pieces of the cell. So the insulin unlocks those cells and lets the glucose in. The glucose cannot get in easily without the insulin. So, so in the body, what happens slowly is that the cells have a harder and harder time using the glucose and the glucose will 
they won't let the glucose in and the glucose will pile up in the bloodstream. The brain does not need insulin to let the glucose in. The glucose walks in, no questions asked, because the brain is a, needs a lot of energy. And some of that energy must come from glucose. So the brain has no barrier. It says, please, glucose, come in. We do not need any insulin, just please come in. Um, so if, if your blood sugar is very high, your brain sugar will be very high. It's always proportional, always directly. If you have high blood sugar, you will have high brain sugar. But if you have high blood insulin, um, it's the insulin that has a hard time getting into the brain. So because the receptors that let the insulin into the brain become resistant, they become damaged or smaller numbers of them. And so the insulin, uh, the glucose comes in no problem. And that high glucose, every time you get a blood glucose spike, you get a brain glucose spike. And that's causing inflammation and oxidation inside the brain. And then to make it worse, you have not enough insulin to process all that glucose and turn it into energy. So you have a brain which is surrounded, swimming in glucose, but starving mm. because not insulin. So this is the big difference from between the body and the brain. I'm very happy that you, yeah, clear uh, that they explained that because there is a lot of uh, misinformation and or, or half knowledge about the whole um, insulin resistance in the brain, and that's something a lot of people get, you know, a kind of um, pushback if they say, ah, oh, the the brain is going to be in, or becomes into insulin resistant and there will be you know the brain does not need insulin to to um get the glucose in yes but for different things exactly right misinformation is the right word um so so many of my patients will say well i need to eat sugar because i have to feed my brain sugar yeah. well as you know We don't have to eat sugar to make blood sugar. We can make blood sugar out of fat and protein. Yeah. So that's easy. Yeah. Um, a lot of people also think, well, if I can't think clearly, if I can't concentrate, I should eat more sugar. But the more sugar you eat over time, the less your, body, your brain can use it. Mm. So it actually works against you to eat more sugar. And a lot yeah. of people, it's the opposite. So this is a big problem. And yeah. uh, Changing the education. Diese Folge der Evolution Radio Show wird gesponsert von Brain Effect. Vielleicht kannst du dich an Brain Effect erinnern. Ich hatte schon den CEO zu Gast, Fabian Völsch. Er spricht über die besten Biohacks, was Schlaf, Stress und Performance betrifft. Brain Effect entwickelt Performance-Produkte, die dir dabei helfen, mehr Leistung zu bringen zu können, dich besser zu regenerieren. Und da darf natürlich MCTL nicht fehlen. Brain Effect hat Rocket C8, ein MCTL, das nur aus C8 Fettsäuren besteht. Es ist geschmacksneutral, wunderbar einzusetzen, ob es dir in deinen Kaffee gibt, in, gibt in einen Salat oder Smoothie, alles geht. Wenn du Rocket C8 testen möchtest, dann schau doch auf www.brain-effekt vorbei, klick einfach auf den Link in den Show Notes und mit dem Gutscheincode KETO20 erhältst du jetzt 20% Rabatt. Jetzt aber viel Spaß mit der Folge. In your work with, uh, with patients, you, are you um, using, is it necessary to, to go, to use a ketogenic diet and are you, are you, going for that and and so my my follow-up question would be and how how low would you recommend usually to go with the carbs and and what kind of and and the whole plant food issue would you would you recommend going full-blown carnivore or would you just try to to slowly yeah decrease plant food and see where you are or just the others others um other way around, go full carnivore and increase slowly some kind of plant food, like in a, in a elimination diet. What, what's your take on it? Most people are in two categories. There's this category of 
um, they want to do 100%, um, they want to do all at once. Let me take everything out and then gradually put things back in to see which things are bothering them. So some people who consult with me, they want to do a carnivore diet as an experiment, and then they can put back one plant food at a time to see how that goes. Other people are one at a time people, and they want to start here and take one thing away at a time. But I, I recommend for everybody, I sort of have these five different levels. So I recommend for everybody, take out all the processed foods, everybody. I don't care who you are, <laughs> nobody should eat those. <laughs> they are poisonous. So sugar, flour, fruit juice, cereal, take it all out. And just Process hold- food deficiency. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you, it's very, very important, even if you make no other change, even if you don't want to do low carb, just take the processed food out. And when you do that, you have sort of what they like to call kind of a Mediterranean diet or similar to Mediterranean diet, which is really a lot of people think, oh, Mediterranean is olive oil and nuts and wine. Well, it's really also almost no processed foods in a Mediterranean. It's very low in processed foods. And I think that's why it looks a little bit healthier mm -hmm. in the States. Um, but uh, so that's where everybody should start. Uh, well, the next level down is a paleo style where you take out all the modern agriculture foods. So the grains and the beans and the dairy products and take those out because that's a much more nutritious and a safer diet for the body and for the brain because we are very well adapted evolutionary from an evolutionary perspective to digesting and using those foods. And when you have a lot of grains and beans, they are working against your nutrition. They make it hard for the brain to get nutrients. So, and they're very low in nutrients themselves. They're terrible sources of most nutrients. So to remove those, that makes a big, big difference for a lot of people. So the first step is no, no process. The second is try the paleo. The third is low carb. Now, if you have insulin resistance, I think you should go directly to low carb. But not everybody has insulin resistance. Some people may not need to be low. Low carb is safe for everyone with very, very few exceptions. Very few exceptions, safe for everyone. But not everybody wants to do this and not everybody may need to do this. But this is really important if you have damaged carbohydrate metabolism. Even this paleo diet is going to have too much natural sugar in it from fruits and from root vegetables. So. If you have insulin resistance, this is low carb is good. And then, and then below that you have the uh, more low plant or carnivore diet. So if you do this low carb paleo diet and you still don't feel right, then you might have some sensitivities to plant foods um, like nightshades, which are things like tomatoes and peppers and eggplant, or you might have the sensitivity to to other kinds of plant foods. And so for some people, it's very important to uh, experiment with low plants or even no plants for a little while to see if that makes a, a, a even more difference. So some people do this like this and some people do this like this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Would you say they, if you have a depression or ADHD or bipolar disorder, would you go straight to, to keto or this is an excellent question it really does depend on the disorder and the severity of the disorder and whether or not the person has insulin resistance okay. and what other problems they have but generally speaking if you have a serious mental illness that is maybe you've been in the hospital uh maybe you are unable to work because of uh, because of serious depression um suicidal um uh, thinking or if you have a, a psychosis symptoms um, from schizophrenia or similar psychosis symptoms, if you are really struggling, then I think a ketogenic diet is, a, is really worth trying because serious mental illness in most cases suggests that the brain metabolism is very damaged. And not in every case, but in many cases. And so um, the, uh, bipolar disorder, for example, 
true bipolar disorder they used to call manic depression, very uh, extreme moods, is very similar to epilepsy. And we know that ketogenic diets are, are really very, very powerful treatment for epilepsy. So bipolar disorder, I think a ketogenic diet is a very good place to start. Um, for psychotic disorders, I think it's a very good place to start. But these other sort of mild depression, mild anxiety, ADHD, sometimes those are just food sensitivities, and sometimes they are just a lot of junk and a lot of processed foods and too much sugar. Mm -hmm. so just getting rid of the, you know, just, just cleaning up the diet can make a, a big yeah. difference. There's been some excellent studies in Europe uh, many years, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, many of these ADHD in children, if you clean the diet and just eat uh, simpler foods, yeah, whole foods, then a lot of these kids, two thirds to three quarters of children, know a very, very uh, significant improvement in ADHD, or sometimes even completely disappear yeah. Yeah. after a couple of weeks. So um, the milder conditions sometimes, and then there are cases of psychosis, schizophrenia where all you do is take the gluten out, just take out the yeah. wheat, and it disappears. So yeah. there are these exceptions, but I think uh, um, uh, and there's, by the way, for your listeners, there's on the Diet Doctor website, I have a guide for four different uh, episodes. If you are taking a psychiatric medication and you're trying a ketogenic diet, please read that first. It's free. Yeah, because I will link to it in the show notes. Because the, yeah. if you take medications, the keto diet is important to pay yeah. attention. Yeah. Yeah. As you mentioned, that would you would you recommend? Sure, that someone who is really who is on medication should consult with his psychiatrist. Just let him know or her know that that he or she is is trying something different. Absolutely, the medications, uh, and this isn't a problem with the diet. It's a problem with the medications. And so if you're not taking a medication, it's very safe uh, to try a ketogenic diet. But if you have a serious mental health problem and you're seeing a therapist or a psychiatrist or a nurse, um, you should tell them and talk to them first because there is this transition. The first few weeks can be very, it's a very powerful intervention and it can change your brain chemistry very quickly and your body chemistry. So the first couple of weeks can feel difficult. <laughs> and for people, they can become more anxious or more depressed while they're changing their diet. Yeah. You want extra support and have somebody help and, uh, and work with you uh, to make sure. If you're taking a medication, the diet can change the level of the medication, the amount of the medication in the blood very quickly because it's such a powerful intervention. And so for some medications, this can cause temporary problem and whoever is prescribing your medication can adjust mm. the medication so that you don't have any problems with yeah. the... I think that's that's really important to mention that there that if someone takes medication, it's very important to talk to the, the doctor about it. Diese Episode der Evolution Radio Show wird unterstützt von Brain Effect. Brain Effect entwickelt Produkte zur Steigerung deiner mentalen Leistungsfähigkeit. Und Regeneration spielt nicht nur im Sport eine ganz wichtige Rolle, sondern auch im stressigen Berufsleben. Es ist unerlässlich für höchste Performance. Recharge vom Brain Effect hilft bei der Regeneration. Es enthält hochwertige Aminosäuren für die Muskeln. Magnesium unterstützt deine Muskelzellen und füllt den Elektrolytspeicher auf. Außerdem ist noch Zink und Vitamin B6 drinnen. Das wiederum unterstützt das Immunsystem. Recharge wurde entwickelt gemeinsam mit dem Sportwissenschaftler Prof. Dr. Froh Böse und es ist auch ein Kölner Listeprodukt, das heißt sicher zu verwenden für Profi und ambitionierte Hobbysportler, was natürlich ganz, ganz wichtig ist. 
Mit dem Gutscheincode KETO20 erhältst du jetzt 20% Rabatt auf alle Einzelprodukte. Mehr Informationen auf braineffect.com oder einfach auf den Link in den Shownotes klicken. Und wir bedanken uns hiermit sehr für die Unterstützung bei unserem Sponsor Brain Effect. Und nun viel Spaß mit der Episode. One, one thought I had about ADHD is exactly, I think sometimes it's like, you know, the children are getting all those, those sugars and, and really they're, they're, sit, they're forced to sit, I don't know, six, eight hours a day. It's totally not evolutionary. <laughs> we, are, we are not made for that. They are forced to sit at, at a very young age and then they are just bombarded with with sugar and with all those you know with with all those those um you know social media and, and tv and everything and i think it it just adds up and then I, my, my at least that's my hypothesis that it's just uh, a manifestation of of children not living in a in a evolutionary setting and just be yeah just fed the sugar and it's like you know it's like an energy drink it's like i'm, I'm giving the children a lot of lot of energy and, and not letting them yeah s spend it you're exactly right um that you know we're not designed to be sitting down all day i mean kids get restless and they want to go outside and play yeah. and they say no sit in your seat and listen um and and then you and then we think of these food we think of processed foods as uh foods for children yeah we, it's crazy we think yeah. of you know, juice boxes and cereals and yogurt with sugar and everything with bright colors and we think of as, as cereals we think of these things as children this is not good food for children this is poison yeah. literally in the brain and even worse they're very addictive. You are uh, you are then teaching your child to have an addiction to yeah. sugar at a very young age that then becomes very difficult to stop. Yeah. And so uh, everybody who knows how hard it is to stop eating sugar, the first few days are really terrible. So this is just an addiction. And the younger it starts, the harder it is to undo it. I hope that someday um, it will be yeah, banned to, to really market these kinds of foods specific, specifically to children, you know, like the, the cereal boxes with the funny cartoon characters and everything. So when I was a child, we had um, uh, gum cigarettes or, you know, chewing gum cigarettes and, and cigarettes with, uh, made out of, of chocolate. That's crazy. And, and of course that was banned some <laughs> some years ago but I think all the the baby uh, cookies uh, which are just shaped like animals or um, all as I mentioned the, the cereal boxes with the cartoon characters I think that's that that has to has to stop that's an excellent Excellent point. And the um, I listened to a lecture recently by um, Dr. Joan Ifland, I F L A N D. It's available free on YouTube for people to watch. And she studies the marketing of food to children, marketing of processed food to children, and how so much of it is um, controlled. Uh, the, the tobacco companies bought a lot of the food companies. And they use their same marketing techniques to target children. Wow. It's really terrifying. The last point or the, the last topic I really want to go into is, and, and you mentioned it several times, is the risk of plant-based diets and why we do really need animal food, especially for our brain and for mental health. Maybe I, I'm sure there is there are a lot of hour long talks about that topic and I, I found them on YouTube and I will link to all of them in the show notes. But if you could give us a, yeah, just a, a synopsis of all your, of your, your um, thinking. Absolutely. So I am worried about plant-based diets, particularly because most people do not realize 
how important it is to supplement a plant-based diet, not just with vitamin B12, but there are many nutrients which are difficult, very difficult to get from plants. If you eat only plants without any supplements, that is, that is, um, uh, that you will not be able to survive. Um, plants are missing many essential nutrients and are very, very low in uh, quite a few nutrients, vitamin K2, the essential fatty acids, the omega-3 fatty acids, even certain omega-6 fatty acids. Um, and uh, um, they are, they are, it's harder to get iron from a plant-based diet. It's harder to get minerals like zinc from a plant-based diet. And, and it's even can be harder to get, um, to get uh, vitamin A from a plant-based diet, depending on what you're eating. So many, the plants are low in nutrients and they're high in what are called anti-nutrients. So they contain naturally substances which block or interfere with our ability to extract certain nutrients from food like iron and zinc, for example. So, um, so uh, for all of those reasons, if you remove all the animal foods from the diet and you don't put in all the supplements you need, you are very high risk for uh, nutrient deficiencies. And nutrient deficiencies are very common uh, in the general population, but they're also even more common in people who have mental health disorders. So it's very, very important um, to understand that the studies that tell us that plant-based diets are healthier than a, than a diet that includes meat, all of those studies do not just remove animal foods. They remove almost all the processed foods, they, all the sugar, all the flour, um, and all the fried foods and the packaged foods. It, they're whole foods diets that are plant-based. So we don't know. If you simply remove the animal foods from your diet, we have no idea if that's healthier. So um, uh, it's, it's really important to understand the science does not support removing animal foods from the diet. So if you choose a plant-based diet, that's okay, that's your choice, but please supplement very, very carefully um, and learn everything you can and, and make sure that it's a whole foods diet and because you can eat junk food all day long and still have a vegan diet, yeah. very, very dangerous. <laughs> that's the worst of the that's combination. <laughs> all the processed foods and not enough nutritious animal foods the animal foods contain everything you need in the right form, um, easy to digest and easy to access nutrients. A, the, a good plaidoyer for our, <laughs> to, to finish up the, this wonderful, wonderful interview. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm, I'm linking to all your videos and of course to the Diet Doctor article and to your website diagnosisdiet.com. So, everyone who wants to connect with you and get maybe your insights on um, keto diet in the context of mental disorders or psychiatric disorders can contact you via the website. Is that correct? Yes, uh, so I do, uh, I do also have a consult service that you can access through my website if you want to talk with me directly about if you're a clinician or if you're a patient who wants some advice, I'm happy, happy to talk with you. Um, and, and Julia, thank you very, very much for everything you are doing to get this information out there. And it was just so wonderful to meet you in person at Keto Live in Balloon. Are you coming next year to Keto Live? Oh, I'm not sure yet, but... I, I'm planning to, but are you, are you going? Yes, yes. Um, so ne next year, uh, I'll be giving presentations about brain development, nutrition. Oh, great. For, uh, for baby and ch child, infant brain development and all the nutrients and how, yeah. how you build, build the best possible brain. Yeah, very important topic since I think, you know, it starts... In the yeah already during development the fetal development if there aren't the right the right nutrients there how should the brain develop and I think a lot of problems we are seeing now are probably already you know it starts already 
in the development and that the mothers are nutrient deficient and not really good. Yeah, there are not enough omega threes and all the important fatty acids to to build a healthy brain. <laughs> That's exactly right. So the conference will begin with the brain development and it's going to finish with, uh, at the last day will be Dr. Stephen Kunane. Oh, he is great. Alzheimer's and ketone, oh. just amazing, a, a world-class researcher finishing the conference. So we'll start with baby brain and we'll end with um, aging with brain. Aging brain. Wonderful. That's, yeah. No, thank you very much for the wonderful interview and yeah, see you thank again. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, thanks everybody for listening. Halt, 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 noch nicht ausschalten. Falls du mehr zu dieser Folge wissen möchtest, den Link zu den Show Notes findest du unten in der Videobeschreibung. Vielen lieben Dank für deinen Support. Jeder Daumen nach oben und jedes Abo hilft uns. Wenn du jetzt an jemanden denkst, dem diese Folge sicher weiterhelfen kann, dann teile sie doch. Wenn du eine unserer vorigen Folgen anschauen möchtest, die findest du gleich hier. Also, bis zum nächsten Mal.